The Subcommittee on Environment will come to order. Without objection, the Chair is authorized to declare recesses of the Subcommittee at any time. Welcome to today's hearing entitled, Examining the Nation's Current and Next Generation Weather Satellite Programs. I recognize myself for five minutes for an opening statement. I'd like to first thank our witnesses for being here today. This committee has a long-standing interest in the weather satellite programs of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, as evidenced by our continued oversight of these programs spanning multiple Congresses. I am also pleased to have the Department of Defense here today to discuss their weather satellite missions and the cooperation and coordination between the DOD and NOAA that result in expert forecasts that save lives and property. After the National Polar Orbiting Operational Environmental Satellite System, NPOSE, partnership failed to curb costs or yield benefits, the administration directed NOAA and the DOD to develop individual polar orbiting weather satellite programs. This has come to fr fruition with NOAA's Joint Polar Satellite System, JPSS, the first of which is slated to launch in March of 2017. Given that we are currently relying on the experimental turned operational SUAMI NPP, it is my hope that this program suffers no further delays and this launch date is met. There has been improvement in the JPSS program over the past few years, but there are still potential causes of concern which we will explore today. Meanwhile, the DOD began its own weather satellite program, the Defense Weather Satellite System, DWSS. However, this plan was scrapped in 2012 and the department is now planning a new generation called the Weather System Follow-on, WSF. In the meantime, the DOD currently relies on its existing satellite system, the Defense Meteorological Satellite Program, DMSP. These DOD satellites, much like NOAA's existing fleet, are aging rapidly. One of them, DMSP-19, failed earlier this year, increasing the fragility of the system. The possibility of data gaps looms large as both agencies look to create a more robust satellite architecture. Further complicating these issues is the reliance the agencies place on themselves and our international partners for critical weather data. The polar orbiting satellite data, for, for polar orbiting satellite data, there are three primary orbits. The, the early morning orbit is operated by the DOD, the mid morning orbit by UMETSAT's METOP program and our partnering uh, satellite agency in Europe, and the early afternoon orbit by NOAA. 80% of the data that goes into our numerical weather models comes from polar orbiting satellites. Since we rely so heavily on these satellites, it is important for these orbits to continually be filled. While these government satellite systems play an important role in providing data that predicts weather, I also want to highlight the growing role of the private sector. Let me be absolutely clear. I am not in any way suggesting the privatization of NOAA. Some people have suggested that, or the National Weather Service. However, the advancements of the commercial weather satellite industry has real potential to improve our forecasting capabilities as well as provide gap mitigation in the event one of our satellites suffers a, a failure or further delays. NOAA has released a commercial uh, space policy, a draft of its commercial space activities assessment process, and is currently operating a commercial weather data pilot program to test and validate private sector data for integration into its numerical weather models. I applaud NOAA's prog uh, progress and look forward to further action on this front. This committee will remain vigilant in its oversight responsibilities to ensure that Americans have the best possible weather forecast to save lives and property. I now recognize the gentlewoman from Oregon, the ranking member, Ms. Bonamici, for an opening statement. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for your ongoing interest in the important issue of improving weather forecasting. Uh, and thank you to uh, all of our witnesses for being here today. The data collected by NOAA's weather satellites are the backbone of NOAA's weather prediction capabilities and support weather forecasting activities around the globe. NOAA, in coordination with its interagency and international partners, is working diligently to move the National Weather Satellite System into a robust state, so we will have the certainty and continuity of accurate and reliable forecasts and severe storm warnings. In addition to providing uninterrupted weather observations in the near term, NOAA is actively assessing what new capabilities will be required beyond the 2020s to protect American lives and property during extreme weather events. I'm looking forward to hearing about both of these efforts. 
As we've discussed in the past, however, both the geostationary and polar weather satellite programs, GOES and JPSS, have experienced scheduled delays, significant cost growth, technical performance concerns, and management challenges. Although any and all remaining challenges must be addressed, I am pleased to note that NOAA has made significant progress, and we expect to soon be celebrating the successful launches of GOES-R and JPSS-1 satellites. It is critical that these programs remain on schedule to minimize the potential risk to the collection of observations and data that are needed for NOAA's weather forecasting activities. Even the best laid plans can be met with unanticipated events, a launch failure or a potential satellite malfunction, for example. I will be listening for an update on the status of NOAA's contingency plans in the event that we do face a gap in data continuity. And I look forward to hearing about NOAA's efforts to put the weather satellite programs on a path to the robust state that the 2013 independent review team recommended. In addition, the strength of our civil weather satellite system relies heavily on the interagency and international partnerships that NOAA has in place over decades. This morning's hearing provides the opportunity for us to learn more about NOAA's work with the Department of Defense and the communication among partners on future weather satellite planning efforts. As we look ahead, NOAA's partnerships are expected to extend to commercial entities. NOAA is taking concrete steps toward implementing its commercial, commercial weather data pilot program in response to direction in the fiscal year 2016 Omnibus Appropriations Act. In fact, I understand that Dr. Volz will be attending an industry day workshop immediately following our hearing, where he will receive feedback from companies interested in participating in the pilot program. I'm encouraged that NOAA has implemented the Commercial Weather Data Pilot Program promptly and has provided an open dialogue throughout the process. Finally, the planned launches of both GOES-R and JPSS-1 satellites should not mark the conclusion of NOAA's programmatic efforts, but rather should be the figurative launching pad of the planning and development of our next generation of weather satellites. I look forward to hearing about both NOAA's polar follow-on program and its long-term architecture plans. And before I yield back the balance of my time, I'm going to note, uh, Mr. Chairman, I do need to run to a markup, and I'm going to do my best to get back as soon as possible. My colleague, Mr. Grayson, will take over until I can get back. And I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The gentlelady yields back. I'd like to now recognize the ranking member of the full committee, Ms. Johnson, for a five-minute opening statement. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, let me um, welcome the witnesses, and I'm pleased to see that Dr. Volt and Dr. Porner here again to provide updates on our nation's critical weather satellite uh, development programs, JPSS and GOESR. I am looking forward to hearing from both of you and Mr. Stoffel and Ms. And Ms. Uh, Chaplin about the relationship between the Department of Defense and NOAA and how that partnership helps meet both civilian and defense needs. I want to be clear that NOAA's weather satellite programs play a critical role in ensuring the continued health of our weather forecasting capabilities, and they support weather forecasting activities around the globe. Although both JPSS and GOES-R has experienced significant cost growth and management and technical challenges during this development. I am pleased to learn that NOAA has responded to recommendations from GAO and others, and that we expect to have both satellites launched within the year. However, as we will hear today, there is still more work to be done. Concerns about a potential gap in our satellite coverage must be addressed and NOAA must apply lessons learned to ensure future programs do not face identical challenges. As I've said before, we must take all necessary steps to ensure that there is not a gap in satellite coverage and support of our weather forecasting capabilities. The successful launch of these satellites is critical to ensure our nation maintains its weather forecasting capabilities However, it represents the first step, not the last, in NOAA's ever-evolving efforts to protect American lives, property, and critical infrastructure. 
I look forward to hearing more about NOAA's plans to maintain and improve the nation's weather forecasting capabilities. I thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding the hearing, and I yield back the balance of my time. I'd like to thank the ranking member for her opening statement. Um, I'd like to introduce our witnesses today. Our first witness today is Dr. Stephen Voles, Assistant Administrator for the National Environmental Satellite Data and Information Services at the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Dr. Voles has a doctorate in experimental condensed matter physics from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign and a master's in physics from Illinois and a bachelor's in physics from the University of Virginia. Our next witness today is Mr. David Powner, Director of Information Technology Management Issues at the Government Accountability Office. Mr. Pounder received his bachelor's degree in business administration from the University of Denver and attended the Senior Executive Fellows Program at Harvard University. Our third witness today is Mr. Ralph Stoffler, Director of Weather and Deputy Chief of Staff for Operations at the U.S. Air Force. Mr. Stoffler received his Bachelor's of Science in Meteorology from the University of Oklahoma in Norman. Boomer and his master's degree in systems management from the University of Southern California, Los Angeles. Our final witness today is Ms. Christina Chaplin, Director of Acquisition and Sourcing Management at the Government Accountability Office. Ms. Chaplin received her bachelor's degree, magna cum laude, uh, in international relations from Boston University and her master's degree in journalism from Columbia University. I'd like to now recognize Dr. Voles for a five-minute opening statement. Good morning, Chairman Bridenstine, Ranking Member Bonamici, who unfortunately had to depart, and, and members of the committee. I'm Dr. Stephen Voltz, as indicated, Assistant Administrator for NOAA's Satellite Environmental Data and Information Service of ne called NESDIS. The United States depends on NOAA to collect and to provide the critical Earth observations and information needed for weather forecasts, for disaster preparedness, all hazards response and recovery, for the protection of critical infrastructure and natural resources, and also for the continued economic vitality of the nation. Currently, NOAA's observation portfolio is strong and will soon be even stronger. NOAA has launched, with support from our partners, international and interagency, over the last two missions over the last 18 months. First, the Space Weather Deep Space Climate Observing Sat Observatory Satellite, or DISCOVER, in January of 20, uh, February of 2015, and also the Ocean Observing Satellite Jason-3, just earlier this year. Within the next year, NOAA plans to launch the next generation geostationary and polar orbiting environmental satellites, GOES-R and JPSS-1, and the Cosmic 2A radio, constellation, radio occultation constellation of satellites. These launches are only the beginning of a series of next generation satellites soon to take flight. But a significant portion of what NESDIS does is not just in space. All elements of the integrated observing system with satellites, ground operations, assured satellite communications, reliable data archives are essential for our continued mission success. Beginning with the launch of JPSS-1, NESIS will bring online in stages a new upgraded ground operating system with enhanced reliability, security, and lower data latency. This ground system will operate, ingest, and process data, providing information to users around the globe. Similarly, for GOES-R, we are deploying six new ground antennae enhanced to handle the increased data rate expected from GOES-R while staying within the narrow accessible frequency range allowed for our satellite transmissions. In FY 2016, NOAA received funding from Congress to initiate the polar follow-on, the extension of the, J of the polar constellation. With this critical funding, the JPSS program now includes five polar orbiting satellites, Suomi NPP, JPSS 1, 2, 3, and 4. This series of satellites, supported by a NOAA industrial collaboration over the past years and into the future years, is making excellent progress now on the polar follow-on, procuring the critical instrument long lead arguments, items so that we can ensure the delivery of these satellites on cost and on schedule. Earth's weather systems are a global phenomena, and NOAA's satellites are only one piece of a global observing constellation. We are able to accomplish what, accomplish what we do because our many productive and mutually beneficial scientific and operations partnerships built up over years of cooperation and formal agreements that are underpinned by a full, open, and timely data sharing policy. These partnerships allow us to ensure the continued operation of the robust global constellation needed to meet the standards, meet the needs of our, use, our users and stakeholders. 
In order to produce trusted, reliable data that our nation depends on every day, quality validated observations are needed from multiple polar orbits, as Chairman Bridenstine mentioned. Continuing our partnerships now 30 years strong, NOAA and the European Organization for the Exploitation of Meteorological Satellites, or UMETSAT, have agreed to share the burden of the orbiting polar orbiting satellites for the next 25 years. NOAA and UMETSAT will continue splitting coverage for the two primary orbits, the mid-morning and afternoon, and openly sharing data from our, with our respective missions. Within the United States, interagency collaboration allows us to leverage the capabilities, the capacity, and the infrastructure of other U.S. agencies, such as with, NOAA, with NASA, which is NOAA's acquisition agent, and with the Department of Defense. The United States Air Force Defense Meteorological Satellite Program, or DMSP satellites, provide observations for the third early morning orbit that is useful, important for us. And NOAA operates the ground system development and oversees daily operations of the DMSB satellites out of our, ENS, our NOAA Satellite Ops Facility in Suitland, Maryland. These partnerships continue to provide excellent value for the U.S. government as a whole. Looking to the future, we are now preparing for the future observing system, evaluating changes in technology, emerging partnership opportunities, and national trends. Partnerships with the commercial sector and academic institutions can provide flexibility, improve more, including more innovative observing approaches, potentially enhancing our overall observing system reliability. This year, through the Commercial Weather Data Pilot, NESIS is working with the emerging commercial Earth observation community to explore the present capabilities to meet NOAA's observing requirements. Our comprehensive system study will consider all sources as we map out the observing system of the future. Our goal is to deploy observing system within stable budget requirements, but which is also agile and resilient and is responsive to the rapidly changing capabilities and technology of the future. We appreciate Congress's strong support, and we look forward to answering questions during the hearing today. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your testimony. Mr. Pounder, you're recognized for five minutes. Chairman Bridenstein, Ranking Member Johnson, and members of the subcommittee, since my December testimony before this subcommittee, we have continued to review the JPSS program and NOAA's policies and procedures for determining the lifespan of existing and future satellites. Accurately depicting these lifespans is important given potential gaps in coverage and the timing of out-year satellite acquisitions. This morning I will provide an update on the JPSS program, the latest of our estimate on the potential gap, a security assessment of the ground stations, and some observations about the polar follow-on program. JPSS's launch date of March 2017 is on target according to NOAA despite the program missing interim milestones for the spacecraft. ATMS in the ground segment. This is the case since the program had sufficient cost and schedule reserves built into it. This committee's persistent questioning of these reserves over the past several years demonstrates the important role your consistent oversight has played. We still remain concerned about the launch date because the launch readiness date just slipped one month from December 2016 to January 2017. Two key areas to watch are the August ground station delivery and the upcoming thermal vac test, which is the start at the end of this month. So with the March 2017 launch date and a three-month checkout period, which is somewhat optimistic, JPSS-1 is expected to be the primary operational satellite in the early afternoon orbit around June 2017, or roughly a year from now. I'd like to display a chart that I showed at the December hearing at that hearing, I testified and NOAA agreed that it was extending the NPP lifespan from October 2016 to 2020. That's the red arrow at the top of the chart. At that time, we questioned whether it should be extended the full four years given NOAA's assessment. Since then, we've learned that NOAA now labels this four-year extension as fuel limited life, and it is not the expected life of the spacecraft and sensors. This is just another instance where NOAA's charts and satellite lifespans have been misleading to the Congress. Another key question is whether the ATMS instrument on NPP will last until J-1's ATMS becomes operational. We testified in December about the ATMS issues, and they continue. Just recently, we made recommendations to NOAA to develop a policy for updating its flyout charts to include having these lifespans consistently and accurately reported based on detailed analyses. We believe this rigor in developing the flyout charts is critical for NOAA to rebuild trust with both this committee and with the appropriation committees. 
Mr. Chairman, I'd now like, now like to turn to the ground station security findings and recommendations. This is an important area because NOAA has reported several incidents regarding access to its ground system, including hostile probes and unauthorized access. To its credit, NOAA has a system security plan, has performed detailed penetration tests, and is working to address known vulnerabilities. However, NOAA has determined that the JPSS ground system is at high risk of compromise due to the significant number of controls that are not fully implemented. As this next chart displays, NOAA has been working on over 1,000 critical and high vulnerabilities uh, on the current ground station, and hundreds more have been identified from penetration tests on the ground upgrade. Just last night, NOAA provided an update on open vulnerabilities, and they report decreasing roughly 1,500 open critical and high vulnerabilities down to about 1,200, a decrease of 300. Of concern are the critical vulnerabilities associated with the current operational ground station. These actually increase slightly. NOAA needs to close these vulnerabilities much quicker. Some areas to address these vulnerabilities include applying recommended patches and implementing stronger access controls. Turning to the follow-on program, we are all for robust constellations and avoiding any potential gaps like the one we hope does not occur between NPP and J1 but proposals to build J3 and 4 and to store nearly three and six years respectively need to be supported by cost-benefit analysis of different storage and launch scenarios. In addition, these continuity decisions need to be balanced with minimizing program costs. In conclusion, NOAA has done a solid job coming out of the NPOS debacle and being on the verge of the J1 launch. Monitoring the remaining tests in the ground station delivery is important in these remaining months to see if the March 2017 launch date holds. Regarding the gap between NPP and J1, ATMS where is the critical watch list item. NOAA also needs to more accurately inform Congress of satellite lifespans and potential gaps in coverage. And finally, they need to better secure ground stations to avoid security incidents involving the loss of critical weather data. This concludes my statement. I look forward to your questions. I'd like to thank the gentleman. Mr. Stoffler, you're recognized for five minutes for an opening statement. Chairman Bridenstine, Ranking Member of Bonamici and members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to appear before the you. The gentleman yield for one second. Can you move your microphone to be in front of you? All right, good. Let me start again then. Chairman Bridenstine, Ranking Member Bonamici and members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to appear before you this morning to discuss space-based environmental monitoring and the partnerships that ensure accurate and timely forecast capabilities. Air Force weather is comprised of people, systems, and processes that together deliver unique services to the Joint Warfighter, the United States Air Force, and the United States Army. Air Force's weather primary mission is centered on analyzing and forecasting global weather and solar impacts on military and combat operations. We strive to minimize the impact of weather threats to friendly forces while simultaneously capitalizing on weather conditions that maximize the operational advantage over enemy forces and exploit enemy weaknesses. We achieve our mission with total force airmen, uniformed and civil servants around the world, educated and trained on space and weather impacts to the warfighting mission. Our airmen serve in capacities requiring combat field skills, move, shoot, communicate skills, combat lifesaver qualifications, and Army Airborne and Special Operations parachutist competencies. We develop theater weather sensing strategies for each operation and leverage all appropriate available data sets. We minimize data gaps by deploying Air Force tactical weather centers and incorporating data from non-traditional weather sources to develop the environmental picture of the battle space. We achieve this through cooperative engagements with our coalition partners, military to military engagements, national and international cooperation, and Department of Defense unique programs. We analyze and assimilate this data into our operational centers and our numerical models to present a unified forecast to the coalition warfighting team for multiple security classification levels. The warfighter receives a timely and consistent battle space weather picture in the planning and execution phases of an operation that addresses strategic, operational, and tactical needs. In the post-combat portion of operations, we work to normalize the impacted nations by training personnel and restoring basic meteorological services which allows the Department of Defense to withdraw its resources to be ready for the next engagement. Fundamental to nearly all Miller operations and all levels of the military decision-making process is the information and data provided by weather satellites. 
We fully recognize that the American private sector can provide technological advances in research in the science of our craft to provide an essential element to our weather enterprise. While this progress is exciting, we must balance our portfolio with constraints on human capital, physical means, and prioritization to ensure our future capabilities directly correlate to the combat commander's warfighting needs. Thank you again for the opportunity and privilege to testify before you today. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. I'd like to thank the gentleman for his testimony. Ms. Chaplin, you're recognized for five minutes. Chairman Bridenstine, Chairman Smith, Ranking Member Johnson, Ranking Member Bonamici, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for inviting me to discuss GAO's recent work on defense weather satellites. DOD's polar orbiting weather satellites, known as DMSP, currently cross the equator in the early and mid-morning orbits, while NOAA satellites cross the equator in the afternoon orbit. DOD will not continue replacing satellites in the mid-morning orbit, as it was decided in the aftermath of the NPOST program that the U.S. will rely on the Europeans for this orbit. In addition, last year DOD was directed not to launch the last DMSP satellite planned for the early morning orbit in light of congressional concerns with lack of planning, coordination, and execution of activities to continue meeting DOD's weather requirements. But because the 19th DMSP satellite in the early morning orbit recently failed prematurely, DOD has put dismantling of its last satellite on hold. DOD undertook an analysis of alternatives for future weather satellites from 2012 to 2014. We were mandated by the Congress to review this study. Undertaking the analysis was a good step. In the past, we have found satellite programs did not perform a rigorous analysis or conducted one with a solution already in mind. In addition, DOD is considering significant changes to its future space architectures to increase resiliency and is operating under a constrained budgetary environment, which ultimately means DOD needs to find ways to reduce the cost of acquisition, either by paring back its requirements or doing business differently. A thorough analysis of alternatives can help DOD navigate all these challenges. Ideally, DOD would have conducted this analysis in the aftermath of the cancellation of NPOS in 2010. By the time it started its analysis in 2012, it was already facing a gap for measuring ocean winds and more gaps were looming. The lag in planning for a new satellite system is not unique to weather. The GAO has been concerned about similar lags for missile warning satellites and protected communication satellites. The longer it takes to assess and decide on what path to take, the more DOD is at risk of facing critical gaps or having to continue buying legacy satellites. We found DOD made an effort to plan for future weather satellites with a more cost-effective approach in mind, including consideration of which capabilities DOD needed to provide and which could be provided by leveraging other sources of data. The effort to rationalize requirements is also a positive step. Too often, past programs sought to answer too many requirements, all with the most advanced technologies. The technology and design problems encountered by NPOS were partly due to problems with reining in requirements. We also found the analysis was useful for informing plans for new satellites that can measure ocean winds and tropical cyclone intensity and for a new space weather sensor that could be integrated on other satellites. However, we found the analysis was less useful for informing plans for DOD's two highest priority capabilities, cloud characterization and theater weather imagery data, now facing near-term gaps over the Indian Ocean. While DOD consulted with a wide range of stakeholders in conducting the analysis, it did not effectively collaborate with NOAA, which represents DOD's interest to international partners. Specifically, NOAA was not involved in the reviews of the analysis or regular discussions with the study leadership team though discussions were had with a technical consultant to NOAA. The lack of formal collaboration and coordination with NOAA contributed to an incorrect assumption about the continued availability of critical weather data from European satellites. As a result, the analysis did not fully assess solutions for these high priority capabilities. Because DOD did not thoroughly evaluate its top two weather priorities during the analysis, DOD is now assessing how to fill these gaps, leading to additional lags in planning. The failure of the DMSP satellite and the termination of DMSP-20 have heightened the need to do so. It should also be noticed that ineffective coordination has been a recurring problem in space, notably with the NPOS program, but with other space programs as well. 
In closing, we recognize that this type of analysis is extremely challenging to conduct, more so given the rigor and scope DOD applied to it. But in light of the importance of cloud characterization and theater weather imagery data to DOD's mission, it was incumbent on the Air Force to work more effectively with NOAA. Since our report, they have taken actions, and I can talk about those during the hearing. This concludes my statement, and I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you for your testimony, Ms. Chaplin. We have with us uh, now, we're going to go a little bit out of order, but the chairman of the full committee, a uh, good friend of mine from Texas, Mr. Smith, you are recognized for five minutes for an opening statement. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate uh, the opportunity to be able to go at a turn for an opening statement. Uh, and I want to thank our witnesses for being here today. Uh, the Science Committee has held many hearings on NOAA's troubled weather satellite programs over the years. These problems largely stem from the federal government's ill-fated consolidation of civilian and military weather and climate systems, which created slow, costly, and inefficient interagency programs to handle our weather predictions. In 2010, when it became apparent that the National Polar Orbiting Environmental Satellite System was a failure, the administration canceled it and left the agencies, namely NOAA and DOD, to create their own individual polar programs. In NOAA's case, they initiated the JPSS satellite, which unfortunately has continually encountered delays, cost overruns, and mismanagement. Over the last several years, NOAA's spending for satellite operations has ballooned to account for roughly 40 percent of its total budget, over $2 billion. This prevents NOAA from adequately pursuing other important areas of science, service, and stewardship. NOAA now proposes to move forward with the next series of weather satellites using the same technology, the polar follow-on. So I am concerned that the same problems that have occurred over the last 10 years might continue. This committee needs assurance that NOAA will get its government satellite spending under control and be able to meet future forecasting needs. Congress should not continue to fund an over-budget program that is not performed up to its standards. So what is NOAA doing differently with its next series of satellites that justifies such high continued funding? I fear that the answer is nothing. I am also not convinced that NOAA is adequately mitigating the very real, real possibility of a gap in our weather data. In the face of real threats, NOAA should be doing all it can to prevent data gaps, yet they continue to drag their feet and not consider all options. The growing private sector weather enterprise could mitigate NOAA's shortcomings through new technologies and sources of data, but NOAA shows that it will only take action if forced to do so. If NOAA is afraid of innovation, maybe they shouldn't be in the business of deciding what technologies are needed for improved forecasting. For instance, commercial satellites equipped with the latest technology could help prevent data gaps, provide new kinds of advanced data, improve current and future model forecast, and do so on a much faster timeline at lower cost than large and slow government systems. So why isn't NOAA considering these? NOAA should absolutely consider the help that the private sector can provide. In this case, commercial innovation beats the status quo of slow, costly government systems. Faster, better, and cheaper solutions take vision, competence, and courage. NOAA needs more of these qualities. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I look forward to hearing from our witnesses today about how we can get our nation's future weather data back on track and on time to provide our citizens with the critical weather forecast they need and deserve. Now, let me also say, regrettably, I have another committee markup going on at the same time, uh, so I'm going to be shuttling back and forth between the committees. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You're back. <clears throat> Thank you, Chairman, for your opening statement. Thank you to all of our witnesses for their testimonies. Members are reminded that committee rules limit questioning to five minutes. Uh, the chair now recognizes himself uh, for five minutes. I wanted to uh, start by addressing uh, the issue that we recently had on another committee I serve on, the Armed Services Committee, with Mediosat 7, uh, which was going to do cloud characterization uh, and theater weather imagery uh, over the Indian Ocean, uh, which is critically important for our warfighters uh, serving on that part of the world. Um, we had hearings on our committee when we learned that Mediosat 7 was not going to be able to continue doing those functions um, and that the Europeans were not planning to replace it with what we thought they were going to plan to replace it with. Uh, so we started um, having hearings and trying to figure out what, what, what are we going to mitigate this gap with. Um, and then <clears throat> ultimately, 
Uh, we just learned uh, last week that the Europeans are indeed going to launch uh, a new satellite and move Meteosat 8 over to a region that is close to where Meteosat 7 was so that we can get some of the same capabilities back. Um, I wanted to uh, ask Mr. Stoffler if, if you would comment on the process that we went through uh, from believing we were secure in a solution to not having a solution and then going and, and finally looking like we've got a good solution. If you could share with us what that solution is and, and the process that, that we went through to get there. Chairman, I appreciate that question. And uh, certainly, you're, you're very correct. Um, we were planning all along that the Europeans would provide us the capabilities over the Indian Ocean. They, like us, have their own priorities, and they had to make a, a change to their plans. When we were first uh, informed of that possibility, we looked at all alternative options that were out there. Certainly, there are other geostationary capabilities over the Indian Oceans, uh, in particular provided both by Russia and China. Uh, our systems are capable of receiving Chinese data, uh, and we did an evaluation of that. Uh, when we determined of the potential of hackings that took place at NOAA, we locked our systems down. Uh, we had the CIO of the Air Force uh, evaluate the situation, and we were told unless this data was really highly operationally needed, we should not use it. <laughs> we then went to the Director of Operations to determine if we should use it, and the answer was clearly no. Uh, once we were told that Chinese data is off the table, uh, we had to find another alternative. Uh, at that point in time, we began several actions. Uh, one was to go back to the Joint Staff and advise them of this change. We provided briefings, uh, and we also began an outreach on the military side uh, to work with our allies to see what they could do to convince our European allies to move over. And, of course, we outreached to our NOAA partners to see what they could do uh, to help us in that regard. I think we've been very successful, uh, and the end result is uh, we now have what I would call a multi-pronged attack to resolve that problem. First, uh, as you've already said yourself, uh, Europe has been most cooperative. Uh, Meteosat 8 is being moved over. It's going to cover the critical components of our operations in Syria and Iraq. Uh, we will experience uh, a short gap uh, over eastern Afghanistan, uh, and our plan there is, is to work cooperatively with India to use Indian data to, uh, to close that gap. Now, so, now would, that, would that happen immediately, or, or is that some, are we, you said we're going to have a gap. How long is that gap going to be? We don't think to, uh, that we're really going to have a gap. Uh, right now, Indian, the Indian satellite is already operational, is already there. The data is already available here in the United States at a variety of universities. It's a matter of getting it here quicker and more efficiently so we can use it operationally. Okay. Uh, and we're working in conjunction with our NOAA partners to make that happen for us. So we feel very positive uh, that we're going to be able to do that. At what point uh, did you guys reach out to NOAA to, to seek assistance, or did you? I think uh, certainly at my level, uh, we had a lot of informal talks and what the best way and forward was, uh, but we didn't really reach out um, to NOAA formally uh, until after we had made the decision that the Chinese data set uh, would not be uh, able to be used. At that point in time, uh, the Air Force A3 wrote a letter to NOAA, NEZ's in particular, asking to see if NOAA could help us possibly moving a, a spare NOAA satellite over the Indian Ocean. Uh, I want to I bring up something that um, I've heard as an idea. I'm not saying it's a good idea. I'm saying it's an idea, and I wanted to get your input on it. Uh, during the George W. Bush administration, they established the National Executive Committee on Positioning, Navigation, and Timing to coordinate and provide high-level guidance for GPS. Co uh, for GPS. It was co-chaired by the Deputy Defense Secretary, the Deputy uh, Transportation Secretary. The Executive Committee only meets about twice a year, which seems doable even for people who are extremely busy, as, as I know you are. Uh, the National Executive Committee has a permanent staff, uh, working groups, and includes every agency with GPS equities. Is it worth considering a National Executive Committee approach for weather uh, to get attention, coordination, and guidance at the highest levels when we face these kind of gaps? Certainly from my perspective, uh, Mr. Chairman, is that uh, there are a significant number of coordination activities that take place already. We've got the Joint Center for Data Assimilation. Uh, we also work with the uh, Development Test Bed Center. So certainly at my level and below, there's lots of coordination that takes place. I find that very effective. Uh, during the NPOS area, we actually had a, a meeting uh, similar to that, a senior users group meeting where NOAA, NASA, and the DOD got together pretty routinely to discuss things at a very high level. Uh, as you have already attested yourself, the result of that wasn't necessarily positive. 
So I'm not convinced that adding another level of higher level bureaucracy is going to improve the process. Dr. Voles, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, thank you. I think that's a, the, the point you make is a, the need for greater coordination at the, at the senior executive level. And as Mr. Stoffler mentioned, um, when, we, when they reached out to, when the Air Force reached out to us after their Chinese assessment and asked for assistance, we were able to communicate to them our status on GOES, but also that we had been working for some time with our European partners through an international coordination group on meteorological satellites for covering this particular observing system requirement over the Indian Ocean. So that had been in work for some time. Um, I bring that up because we have global coordination activities already in place for meteorological activities for across all the major med agencies in the world. And this is one example where the need for observations over the Indian Ocean was well understood. And there had been a history, and we knew it was going to be going away. And there was a path for an interim solution to, uh, to solve it. Um, so I think the, to addressing the collaborated needs doesn't require, wouldn't necessarily require an executive committee, but greater coordination between the DOD and NOAA as we serve in that role as the international agent for weather um, for the U.S. around the world, and we have done for many, many years effectively. All right. Uh, I'd like to, uh, my time has expired, I'd like to recognize the acting ranking member, Mr. Grayson from Florida. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Stoffel, I want to congratulate you on your origins. As I frequently tell the chair, not everybody can be so fortunate as to be from Oklahoma. <laughs> That's correct. <laughs> Uh, tell me, what kind of data do, do DOD satellites collect other than weather data? Uh, if you're making reference to the Defense Meteorological Satellite Program, uh, we have seven different sensors on there, and they collect weather information as well as space weather information. What, what are the sensors? Uh, specifically, we have a sounder. Uh, What's have, that? Uh, the sounder is something where we collect information uh, regarding remote sensing in the atmosphere, this is data that you would incorporate into the models. Uh, the key sensor that we have on DMSB is the EOIR capability, where we actually take uh, pictures of the atmosphere to see the clouds, specifically visible imagery and infrared vi imagery. What other sensors? I'd have to uh, give you a precise breakdown at another time, sir. All right, well, give me an idea of what they're actually used for. What kind of data do they collect? Well, I mean, the primary mission is uh, we take the uh, the actual pictures, the IR and the VIS, and we incorporate it into a cloud depiction forecasting system. That is the primary purpose of the DMSP. We use the uh, sounding data and we incorporate it into our, uh, uh, into our uh, models uh, from a data simulation perspective. Uh, and we use the space weather sensors uh, into support of our ionospheric uh, modeling system. So those three are the, the primary areas. I got the impression from your testimony that the information is used to provide, uh, 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 how should I put this, uh, weather reports uh, to troops in the field. Is that correct? From, from the satellite perspective, we use the data in two aspects. One, clouds are very, very important to the warfighter. So if I'm sitting in the AOR and I'm planning a mission or a strike, uh, and, and the Air Operations Center wants to know five or six hours from now, where are the clouds going to be? Where is the cloud-free line of sight? Where am I going to hit the target? DMSP provides us data where we can forecast on where those cloud-free areas are going to be. So from an RPA perspective, from a strike perspective, uh, from a bombing perspective, that's where that helps. The sounding data we use for the long-range forecasts out the 10 days to actually create numerical weather prediction on the bigger range weather features. The other thing which DMSP is very critical for is in the execution phase. If you want to know where a haboob is going to be or where you're going to have severe thunderstorm activity, again, from an execution point of view, that's what we use that data for. And we make the data available via the DISM backbone so they can actually see it downrange. Is that information used now or is it just something that's been used in the past? Let me be more specific. Um, has it been used in the past 30 days? Yes. Where? We use that information each and every day. Where do you use it? We lose it in CENTCOM. We use it in PACOM. We use it in Southcom. Could you be more specific? Well, okay. Uh, I would say that uh, at Kabul, for example, we would use that. At Bagram Air Force Base, we would use that. Uh, we would use it over Syria. Uh, we would use it over uh, operations in Iraq. Uh, we would use it over places in, in Russia. Uh, we also use it in South America. Uh, we use it in Korea. Uh, and it's used uh, in Northern Europe. So basically, any place where there's a DOD operation going on, we would use that data. 
I'm surprised here you mentioned South America. What's that all about? Uh, we have uh, some counter drug operations in South America, and we actually have a few weather teams deployed down there. All right. It sounds like uh, the division of labor between you all and NOAA is somewhat ad hoc. Is that a fair statement? Uh, I would not say that it's ad hoc. Our mission is very focused, OCONUS, on military operations. But in terms of who covers what, that seems to be done almost on a case-by-case -case basis rather than according to some kind of master plan. Is that fair to say? I think you need to look uh, at what I would call the international plan. Uh, from an international point of view, from a data-providing point of view, NOAA certainly provides, uh, from our perspective, the two geostationary satellites, goes east, goes west. We use the two European satellites, uh, and we use the Japanese satellite. We also use the European one. So I think there is an international plan of uh, distribution of responsibilities regarding data collections. Dr. Volz, from your perspective, are, is the division of labor between NOAA and DOD ad hoc, or is it according to some master plan? I think the missions of the two agencies are very different, and the, the, the products and services the two agencies provide are different as well. NOAA has a very focused uh, weather forecast, alerts and warnings responsibility for the, for the United States, and as part of our global observation to generate the numerical weather models requires, to, to generate the numerical weather predictions requires global observations. We also have uh, oceans and, and uh, coastal observation requirements and products and services we provide. When you think about uh, speaking, it's not my field exactly, but what the DOD is providing is a very service-oriented um, delivery to their to their own resources or their own applications. We provide a general observation and requirements and weather forecasting for all users. And, and it's up to our other users to come up with more specific detailed uh, recommendations and forecasts and, and products for their particular service application. So I don't think it's overlap in terms of the mission requirements. Ours are broader and more gen general to the general populace. The DOD has a completely different mission from ours. My time is up. Thank you all. <clears throat> Great questions. Uh, as, as somebody who uh, serves in the United States military, maybe I, I can help. Um, uh, w when it comes to mesoscale forecasting in Afghanistan, which is a smaller, smaller level, in Afghanistan, that's not where NOAA is going to be serving the warfighter. NOAA is focused on the United States of America. Uh, the DMSP programs and all the, the weather satellite programs operated by the Department of Defense feed models that will ultimately enable me to determine whether or not I can use a laser-guided weapon or a GPS-guided weapon for a specific target in Afghanistan or some other part of the world. Of course, uh, I did counter-drug operations in Central and South America as a Navy pilot, and I was very grateful that we had ex excellent weather data down south. It could have been better, but my goodness, weather in Central and South America changes so rapidly. I literally see the thunderstorms growing. Uh, I'd like to now recognize uh, Mr. Mulinar from Michigan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I uh, want to thank our witnesses today. Uh, I want to begin with uh, Mr. Stoffler. If you um, just on uh, after canceling the Defense Weather Satellite System, um, Department of Defense initiated an analysis of alternatives for space-based environmental monitoring, and uh, it's my understanding that the conclusions of this analysis prioritized a number of mission critical issues for Department of Defense to, de to pursue. And I just wanted to get your perspective. Is, is Department of Defense pursuing all the mission areas as prioritized in, in this uh, analysis of alternatives? Thank you for that question, sir. And, and yes, we are. We were pursuing all of them. Uh, when we did the analysis, uh, we reviewed the initial uh, uh, requirements are the NPOST program. We revalidated 11 of the 12 original requirements as having clear military utility. And then we determined that a significant number of the uh, needs that we had could be met by existing national and international assets. So we're focused on the, only on buying material capabilities for gaps 3, 8, and 11, i.e. tropical cyclone monitoring, ocean vector winds, and the uh, space-based environment. So you feel that this plan is helping to mitigate these gaps? No question. Yes, it is. Okay. Uh, Ms. Champlin, uh, would you, any comments on that assessment at all? A, a couple things. I would add that the first two capabilities, cloud characterization, theater weather imagery, there's still questions about how to meet those capabilities, and DOD is still studying that after the AOA. During the AOA, it, they consulted some with NOAA on the possibility of using European satellites to fill some of those gaps. 
but because they didn't consult with them enough, they, they didn't get information that helped them form good assumptions for that study. So um, that's, that's still the question up in the air is those two capabilities. Okay, thank you for that feedback. Uh, Mr. Ponder, uh, I wonder, I understand that NOAA needs to launch the first polar satellite JPSS-1 as well as the follow-up JPSS-2 uh, to have a more robust system. And after that, when does NOAA need to launch the remaining two satellites? Well, I think that's uh, still in question. When you look at our, our main concern is a potential gap right here and now between NPP and J1. I think when you look at the plan for J2 and you look at the follow-on programs, J3 and 4, those gaps go away. They really go. The near-term issue is with ATMS on NPP and will it last long enough until we get J1 up there and transition over to the ATMS on J1. That's, I think, the key question in the near term. When you look at the out year, uh, there is a robust constellation being planned. In fact, they're even planning to store satellites three and four, the follow-on programs, for relatively two to three years and then five to six years. That's the current plan. So uh, after we get past this first hurdle, I think the robustness uh, begins. Okay, and, and are we saving money uh, by building satellites now, is that your understanding? Well, that's the, that's the key question. When you look at the out-year satellites, there's economies of scale to go ahead and build these things quicker, especially if we're replicating what we're doing on J2, mm -hmm. and we get that, and we ought to take advantage of that. We also ought to take advantage of some firm fixed prices because we've done these things. There's opportunities to save money. But there's also a challenge with building them quickly and storing them, and there's a cost with that. And you also got to balance that with the annual appropriation process. How do you balance all those things? And I just think no one needs to be real clear in their plans forward that we're justifying the best uh, decisions to ensure robustness but still do it fis where we're fiscally respons responsible. Mm -hmm. And then are you concerned at all about there may be emerging technologies that if we build things now that we wouldn't be able to take advantage of those new technologies? Absolutely. I mean, there's always, you know, leaps with some of these technologies that help with the uh, forecasting with our observational sensors and the whole bit. So, again, you know, we don't want to, there's some sweet spot in there. And, and what, finding that sweet spot where we store not excessively, ensuring that we can actually enhance some of the sensors going forward. Uh, and I think finding that sweet spot, it's still kind of a TBD in our mind. Okay. Well, thank you very much. And, uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. The gentleman yields back. I'd now recognize the gentleman from Texas, Dr. Babin, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and thank you, witnesses, for being here today. Uh, Dr. Volz, it's my understanding uh, that NOAA relies on data from the three distinct polar orbits, early morning, mid-morning, and early afternoon, which are all being filled by different partners, NOAA, DOD, and uh, the European Satellite Program, UMITSAT. How important is each orbit? In order to generate uh, accurate and uh, accurate forecasts and for our numerical weather modeling, we need distributed data and observations from around the globe as frequently as possible. The models we use right now are rely on all three orbits for those for that provision of data. So the timing, those 6 a.m., the 10:30 a.m., and the 1:30 p.m. timing are equally important to the, the the generation of our data models and our forecasts. Okay, so so the data from each orbit uh, is weighed equally when integrated yeah. into numerical weather models. Is that the way that works? I say the the temporal the the distribution of the timing of the data are equal are are equally important. You need that snapshots from different times of the day. We have different sensors in the different orbits, so some are more powerful than others, so the impact of individual measurements from an afternoon orbit may be more than the early morning orbit because of the quality of the instrument. But you need that, you need at least the sound, this weather and temperature soundings at those three orbits to support the overall numerical weather modeling. Okay, what would be the degradation of our weather forecasts if there was a gap or if a partner decided not to fill a certain orbit? We've looked at, over the years, answering that question as we went through the generation of the JPSS program in the pre a few years ago, looking at we call data denial studies or, or analyses of the impact of a loss of a particular orbit. And it does show up as a reduction in the accuracy of the forecast in the three to five or seven day format uh, forecast period when you remove one 
leg of that three-legged stool. And I can give you the specific numbers. I can't quote them off the top of my head. But there is a market change in the accuracy of the forecast and the, in the, in the short-term forecast with the loss of any one of those three. Well, if you can't provide exact figures, uh, can you commit to this committee uh, to do the appropriate research and studies uh, to determine the exact benefit importance of each separate orbit? Yes, sir, we can take that for the, okay. and, and respond. Okay, thank you. And then uh, I'd like to ask uh, several of you, as with most other government satellite acquisitions, weather satellite acquisition efforts consistently have experienced significant cost increases and scheduled delays. Why is this so, and what can be done? To your knowledge, has anyone met cost schedule and performance goals with their weather satellite acquisition efforts? And I would say, uh, Mr. Pounder, if you would go first. Well, clearly, I think there's a lot of lessons learned looking at what happened with NPOs and why we had such huge uh, cost overruns in launches and uh, uh, delays in planned launches. One of the big things you can start with is the level of complexity that was associated with NPOs. At one time, there was an excessive amount of sensors. We got down to five. I think decreasing the complexity is the first start in ensuring that our requirements are real solid. Uh, many times we ask for so many things and our requirements have a lot of nice to haves, but what do we essentially need? So that, that's been a real lesson learned looking back over the, both the GOES and the JPSS programs. Okay, how about uh, Colonel Stoffler, if you don't mind? Well, uh, I, I can certainly echo, sir, uh, what was already mentioned. Uh, having been part of the MPOS program, uh, we tend to uh, want to really build capabilities which advances of the future. So if you, if you make requirements uh, that take you far in advance, there's, there's increased risk. And if you, if you look at DMSP, when you go from a, a capability that has two channels and you try to go to the 24 channels, that really causes a lot of risk. So certainly from a DOD perspective, if you state requirements which are reasonable and allow you to do what you need to do, that's a key way of controlling cost. Okay, and then we probably have enough time uh, for one more answer between Ms. Chaplin or Dr. Volz, which, whichever one. I'd like to add to that, um, just because our work consistently looks at this question. Um, I would add, in addition to the issues which are very legitimate, oftentimes satellite programs attempt to invent technology during the acquisition phase. So if they run across natural discovery problems during that phase, it has a lot of repercussions that drive up costs and schedule. In the case of NPOS, oversight was a very big problem, as well as coordination among the three agencies. And I think weather satellites tend to be a little harder to do because of that. They span so many communities. You have to bring a lot of stakeholders together and work effectively to manage the program right. So I think going forward, both agencies need to look at that issue. Okay, that's great. Did you have something you wanted to say, Dr. Volz? Yes, please. I'd like to respond to that. I agree with both the points <coughs> that our GIO representation, representatives have made. It's consistency and clarity. Consistency of the requirements and clarity of the mission, I think, which are key. And the MPO's example was, an, was a forced marriage between different organizations with different service provisions that we talked about earlier. And I think the lesson was learned, and it has been applied on our JPSS program. In fact, since the 2011 initiation, we have held the, early, the Q2 FY17 launch date for the JPSS mission for the last five years plus. So we've been able, with changes and challenges that we have development, we've managed to keep that um, launch schedule on track. And we've addressed the changes in requirements by holding to a firm baseline of requirements. And that's the provision of the, the follow-ons, is that we do not want to change the mission now, when we have a proven instrument, a proven complement, we can build it again with reliability and, and, ex and with an accurate cost and schedule. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My time has expired. I'd like to thank the gentleman from Texas. <clears throat> We're going to move into a second round, and um, I'd like to start by asking uh, Dr. Volz, uh, one of the uh, things that came out of the, the GAO report um, has been the challenge that we've had with the, the Suomi NPP expected life, and now it's been extended. And um, what, I, don't, I don't think anybody doubts the fact that Suomi NPP is going to be around longer than the, than the expected life at the time of its launch. Um, I think one of the concerns we have is that the, the, the process and the procedures, the clarity for how we go about extending that life, um, it, it, from our perspective, it might look like it's it's, it's subjective. Um, can, can you give clarity on how you make that determination and then maybe in the future have a 
published standards or something that determine how we move forward. So then there isn't a, a question about why it was changed. Yes, sir, and thank you. That's an excellent point, and that was a part of the dialogue we've been having with the GAO over the past couple of months about how we do our flyout charts, how we do our projections. One case of terminology, we don't extend life. We, we update our analysis on the projection of probable life. So it's not a question. We don't decide to terminate or to extend. It's whether the satellite is functioning or not, and we use our analysis, our understanding of its performance to see how far we can project that performance into the future. So what we have done with SUMI NPP, different from our previous, um, our legacy satellites, is from the start done statistical analysis of the instrument capabilities, the instrument performance, the spacecraft lifetime, the expansion, the, the operations of it, how it wears out over time. And, uh, and based on the information from the satellite and the general understanding of our electronics parts and hardware of the whole aerospace industry, come up with projected probability of success, or P sub S, for these satellites into the future. That is our new baseline approach for SUMI NPP, and it will be for JPSS and for our GO satellites going forward. It was not a methodology that was applied in the previous years, so when we try and apply that same rigor to legacy satellites, which don't have the basis of information that we started with, it's hard to retrofit that analysis. So we're not going to be able to look at a POSE satellite launched 15 years ago and apply the same rigor of analysis that we can to JPSS. We don't have the basis. But our plan is to have a transparent process for how we do this on an annual basis, how we update our flyout charts, where the assumptions that are built into it are stated, and then we can discuss whether they're appropriate, but they're clearly stated for all to see. That's, that's great. We, we uh, thank you for, for, for that. Um, when you think about uh, the NOAA 16 satellite that uh, broke up randomly, and I shouldn't say randomly, um, it broke up, and uh, do you have any clarity on that? And the, one of the concerns we have is could that same fate be the, the, the fate of Suomi NPP? So given the, the fr answer to the first question is I don't have clarity on the exact breakup reasons for NOAA 16. It was non-communicative at the time. It had been inert for some time. So it spontaneously de uh, devolved or, or, or uh, broke up. So we don't know the root cause. We can speculate on what they might be. Um, but it, whether it was an in, something internal to the spacecraft or a, a micrometeor or object debris, those effects and those risk factors are factored into our analysis of SUMI NPP. So we routinely, for example, do uh, debris avoidance maneuvers for SUMI NPP when we know, based on our tracking, that there are potential conjunctions with other debris. So we are mitigating that to the extent that we can, that we can see these objects. For the, uh, as I mentioned before, the health and status, the battery life, the, the propulsion systems in the satellite, we monitor on a regular basis. So spontaneous explosion or, or breakup from anything internal, we're tracking the engineering capabilities very carefully in the spacecraft to know whether or not that's a probable possibility and mitigating them if we see any effects. Okay, got it. Um, I wanted to ask about the, um, the uh, commercial uh, pilot program, uh, commercial data program. Uh, can you give us an update where you are on that and how it's going? It's, it's going at a relatively breakneck speed. I know that may not seem like that to the commercial side, but to the government side, it is relatively quick. Um, we have, uh, since our beginning of this fiscal year, with the authorization for this, the weather data pilot, we have, as you mentioned in your, or I think uh, Monamichi mentioned in her opening, we have released our process for evaluation. We released an RFI to the community for opportunities for uh, provision of data for us to evaluate as part of the, uh, the pilot process. And we currently have on the street a draft request for quotations from the commercial industry to sell data to NOAA, to NESDIS, for us to evaluate uh, radio occultation data to use uh, for suitability in our use of our weather modeling. Um, we expect that to be closed in a couple of weeks. We actually said we have an industry day this afternoon to answer questions, and the actual request will go out in early August. And I, our, our target is to have data on hand from vendors, or at least a con under contract, by the end of this fiscal year. The challenge right now is that the available data is, is an empty set. There are no observing set commercial sec systems out there now providing data that we can use. But that's why we ex ask for extension to FY17, and the RFQ will actually ask for data in up through April of 2017, looking for anticipating the launch of these assets in the next six months so that we can get those data on board, pay for them, and do our valuation process internally. Got it. And then, uh, Mr. Stoffler, um, the two highest priorities, of course, uh, for uh, for CENTCOM, uh, cloud characterization and theater weather imagery. Um, th there are commercial capabilities that are out there that uh, might not be in space just yet, but are planning launches in as early as 2019. 
Uh, one of them would be hyperspectral uh, capabilities. Um, w would those capabilities be valuable to you for cloud characterization or, um, or, or theater weather imagery? Uh, you, you are right on the money, uh, Mr. Chairman. Those capabilities would be very valuable to us, and uh, we are waiting with great anticipation when that data becomes available. Now, is there, is there a way that uh, the federal government uh, on the Department of Defense side could partner with a, with a commercial company uh, to, knowing that full well that eventually the commercial company will have customers that aren't necessarily the Department of Defense, but could be um, the agricultural industry, it could be um, the, the insurance industry or the transportation industry, shipping industry, uh, but, but um, to signal to the markets that, that there is a demand from the Department of Defense for this kind of capability. Um, is that, is, is, are there ways of partnering today uh, so that we can help get this industry going? We have a, what's called a CRADA, a relationship with a variety of different uh, organizations, both government and uh, industry, which we can leverage to, uh, to advance these types of capabilities. We've also uh, done, just like NOAA has, uh, our program office has gone out and done a request for information to see what's available out there. Uh, and uh, as you've already indicated, our biggest issue right now is that uh, there is nothing to buy. So we're waiting for that to happen. Is it possible to do a partnership where um, maybe uh, the, the private sector would provide the data for free to the Department of Defense? Uh, in return, uh, the, the, the private sector would, would get a, an EELV launch or, or some kind of uh, partnership like that? I'd have to speak to our acquisition agents to give you a proper read on that, sir. Okay. Um, I'd like to uh, recognize uh, the acting ranking member, Mr. Grayson, for a second round of questioning. Thank you. Dr. Volz, the uh, 2013 NOAA, NESDIS, and Na NASA independent review team made several recommendations uh, regarding the weather satellite programs and putting them on what was referred to as a robust state. Uh, do you know what they meant by robust? Yes, sir. The, the, the robust means uh, essentially single fault tolerant or two failures to a gap, which means you can lose any major on-orbit asset and have a second one ready to support the same mission, provide the same information content without interruption. Um, so that would require redundant or redundant capability on orbit at the same time. Uh, we are in that situation, for example, right now with the geostationary satellite constellation. We have two active and one as a backup for either of the two. So we could lose one and a satellite could move over and give us the same coverage. We are not in that condition right now in the polar because um, although we have legacy POSE satellites, they are not as capable and not as functioning at the, at the capacity of the SUMI NPP satellite. So when we look at the JPSS-1 and the JPSS-2, getting two of those, getting to the JPSS-2 launch, so we have both J-1 and J-2 on orbit, both in their, not in their, effectively their prime of life, gets you to that condition of robustness where you have two fully functioning satellites in their prime lifetime um, ready uh, to support the mission. So robustness in this case just means having a backup, is that correct? It's on orbit uh, ready redundancy effectively, in a, in, yes. All right, apart from what you just said, is there anything else that needs to be done in order to secure that condition? The robust condition, that is one approach, that is one piece of the robustness. It also requires the overall observing system is ready and available and functioning as well, which includes not only those two satellites, but as we mentioned, that we have other assets uh, in the morning orbit from the Europeans, in the early AM orbit from the DMSP, and from other partner satellites, that we have a functioning ground system, which is redundant and capable to handle if we have a hurricane come through in one, we have a backup system, we have redundant satellite antennas, et cetera. So the whole of our overall observing system on the NOAA piece needs to be robust and, and reliable. And the observing system of a global system needs to be able to provide the, the data that we rely on. Quite frankly, our, our, our partnership with the Europeans is essential um, as part of our uh, collaborative efforts um, going through the years. And, and their constellation robustness is as um, strong, their requirements are as strong as ours. All right, uh, regarding NOAA's commercial weather data pilot, uh, what other kinds of data can you consider uh, as being likely or possible for future acquisition? When you, when you talk about the future capabilities, there are potentially a number that are likely to be coming around in the near term that are not yet available. Um, Chairman Bridenstine mentioned hyperspectral as one possibility. There are a number of small satellite or even CubeSat versions of sounders that are being 
planned or would NASA is working on launching and we're working with NASA to understand the planned capabilities there. Um, these are, there are, you look for areas where technologies are scalable to smaller size, are affordable by ven venture capitalists or, or small companies, and can meet our requirements. So those three factors fold in in a couple of potentially significant ways. Like I mentioned, hyperspectral, microwave sounding, and additional radio occultation. Imagery has already gone through this transition. We're not a big imagery buyer, but imagery is already seeing that there are commercial applications. Our commercial weather pilot focused on radio occultation first and foremost, because that was the most mature of these potentially emerging capabilities. But I fully expect that as we continue our engagement with the commercial sector, as we look at our strategic plan for the next emerging capabilities for our constellation, that there will be others who are reaching that same level of maturity that will need to be evaluated for their suitability for our measurements. So what kind of time frames are you anticipating for the other data sets? For the immediate future, we're focused right now on the, on the radio occultation in the FY16, FY17. We are looking at options in FY17 of issuing another call for interest on other measurements. Hyperspectral may be one. I mean, without tailoring it to a specific target, saying what else is likely to be in the market available. We are moving forward on our space weather architecture. And there are potential, and we have been expressed interest of, in providing space weather observations that could be useful as well. So these are areas in the uh, 17, in the near-term time frame that may be viable for um, satisfying. Our focus has to be on understanding the capabilities and seeing how they match our requirements and our observational needs. We're a requirements-driven organization, so we look to what our requirements are and how they can be best be met, and we consider commercial emerging along with government built as the what would be the best match to meet our, our mission objectives. Can you be more specific about what time frames we're talking about, how many years out, and so on? Uh, I would expect, right, well, right now for radio occultation, we have seen pro, pro, um, suggestions of launches in the next year. So that would mean we'd be looking at data from an RO system potentially by this time next year or in, in FY17 that would be ready for evaluation. For these other hyperspectral, it's more suggestive, and I, I really, it would depend on the maturity and the development pace of the industry itself. I would not be surprised to see something in the 18 to 19 time frame where there will be demonstra potential demonstrations on orbit at some of these others. But it depends on sources and investments by others outside of our organization. My time is up. Thank you all again. I'd like to thank the gentleman from Florida. Uh, gentleman from Texas, Mr. Babin, is, Dr. Babin, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate it. Um, Colonel Stoffler, one uh, question here I have for you. Let me read you a portion of the national space policy signed by President Obama in 2010. The Secretary of Commerce through the NOAA Administrator, the Secretary of Defense through the Secretary of the Air Force, and the NASA Administrator shall work together and with their international partners to ensure un uninterrupted operational polar orbiting environmental satellite observations. The Secretary of Defense shall be responsible for the morning orbit, and the Secretary of Commerce shall be responsible for the afternoon orbit. Are you familiar with this national policy? Yes, sir, I am. Currently, does the DOD have a plan and money in the budget for maintaining the morning uh, orbit? If not, why is DOD going against national policy? Sir, at this particular time, we're meeting the national space policy objectives as long as DMSP continues to be on orbit. Final decisions haven't been made on whether satellite follow-on but uh, if we launch WSF in the morning orbit, I believe that we're meeting the objectives of national space policy. Okay. All right. I understand uh, that NOAA, uh, this is for you, uh, uh, Mr. Pounder, I'm sorry. I understand that NOAA needs to launch the first polar satellite, JPSS-1, as well as the follow-up, JPSS-2, to have a more robust system that we've mentioned earlier this morning. After that, when does NOAA need to launch the remaining <clears throat> two satellites? Well, I think that's what's uh, currently right now. I think the plan is to launch uh, in the 2024 uh, and 26 timeframes, those two satellites. Uh, and then actually they would be stored for a period of time. So for instance, J3, I believe the current plan is to launch 2024 into store for about two and a half years into 2026. With J4, the plan would be in uh, early 2026 to have it ready to go in storage okay. and launch in 31. 
Okay, thank you. Is NOAA and the federal government actually saving money by building satellites now? They could be because of the economies of scale. Uh, but, the, you know, you got to offset that with some of the storage costs. We understand that isn't excessive, although if you look at what happened with DMSP-20, that ended up being excessive, some of the storage costs there. Again, you got to find what, what's that, that right uh, area where we're building it and having this robust consolation that Dr. Volts referred to. But also, too, you need to balance that with congressional budgets. We know that the, both the GOES program and the JPS, those two programs consume a large portion of NOAA's budget. So if, in fact, you could address other priorities at some point and hold off those out-year satellites, maybe that's the appropriate thing to do. That we would just like to see the analysis provided to Congress, not only this committee, but we get the same questions from the appropriation committees, whether this is the right cadence and sequence for the out-year satellites. And it's really in NOAA's court to prove that that is the best cadence with those out-year satellites. Okay, and then uh, one more question for, for Dr. Volz. Uh, in regard to the uh, SNPP uh, and the ATMS instrument on board, if, that, if the ATMS instrument fails on SNPP, what would be the backup for its measurements until JPSS-1 is operational? We have no immediate backup in orbit for JPS, for the ATMS. However, the observing system requirements that the ATMS is one of a number of observations. You asked the question earlier, what does the loss of one satellite mean? And we can get back to you with that specific answer. The loss of one instrument on one satellite has an impact as well, but the system itself has multiple observation points that are brought in that are used as part of the America weather forecasting modeling. So the impact, and I, I don't have the exact result to tell you what the specific impact would be for the loss of ATMS. Um, I can get that back to you as part of, we've done these studies in the past. But the uh, overall observing system, as we've talked about already here, relies on multiple observations from multiple points. So the loss of any particular asset, while unfortunate, is not, doesn't derail the entire observing system. It just takes, it's an impact that has to, would be absorbed if we don't have a backup on, on, in place at the same time, okay. which is the point of getting to the robust as quickly as we can. Thank you, Dr. Volz, and uh, I'll uh, The gentleman time. yields back. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Babin. Um, we'll go into a third round as long as people are sticking around. You're not, well, I'll, I'll ask a few questions then if that's all right. Um, I, I wanted to uh, bring up uh, a couple of uh, challenges that we've seen within the Department of Defense um, and how we've, we've applied um, some solutions in the Department of Defense uh, when it comes to space-based communications, for example. Uh, we now lease about 80% of our, our communications over the horizon um, from commercial uh, assets. Now, that, that does a number of things for us. Uh, chief among them, it gives us the capacity and the throughput necessary to get the information uh, and, and the high-resolution motion picture imagery from the place uh, where it is to the place that it needs to go. That's number one. But number two, it also distributes the architecture very rapidly uh, in a way where it complicates the targeting solution for our enemies. And, of course, we've seen... Um, the Chinese and the Russians both advance uh, anti-satellite direct ascent missiles, uh, which are of concern to those of us on this committee and on the Armed Services Committee. Um, what, so, so that partnership that we have with commercial industry to do over-the-horizon communications, I think, is very valuable. Um, we've also seen, on, for, for um, narrowband communications, we've seen the success of Iridium, which was a partnership between the Department of Defense, but also international partners, and it was, uh, you know, provided financing initially from Motorola, but eventually there was financing from, from a venture capital kind of capability uh, that came together. And now the Department of Defense is using uh, Iridium very robustly uh, around the world. Um, I would also say when it comes to remote sensing and imagery, we've seen the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency uh, move forward on a commercial space policy uh, where they're buying uh, imagery from space from commercial operators and, and, and they're gonna continue to do that Again, it complicates the targeting solution for the enemy by distributing the architecture, um, and, and it also gets us more data, better data, higher revisit times, things like this. Um, are there partnerships like that when you think about uh, defense weather? Um, could we develop a partnership similar uh, where maybe we have a, a satellite bus 
and, and we attach to it payloads that are necessary for cloud characterization or necessary for theater weather imagery. Um, and and in, in this era of defense sequester, which is damaging our Department of Defense, uh, create more robust partnerships uh, that would be uh, good not only for the Department of Defense and bringing down costs because when you purchase from commercial, you, you ultimately uh, have more customers than just the Department of Defense, which shares the cost, but also distributes the architecture. Mr. Stoffler, uh, could you comment on, on the, are you guys having those kind of conversations about uh, bringing down costs, distributing the architecture, and ultimately getting more data, better data, and higher revisit times? I appreciate that question, Chairman, and, and again, you're right on the money. We are indeed going down that pathway. The first example of that is already what we're doing with GAP-11. Uh, we're going to uh, build a very small uh, space weather center, and instead of sticking it onto one big, huge weather satellite, we're going to add that particular sensor to all future Air Force satellites. So by using disaggregation and placing individual weather sensors onto existing satellites, I think we can uh, get a better picture, a higher refresh rate, and bring down overall costs and, of course, uh, have more resiliency in the constellation as well. Could, could you host those sensors on commercial payloads that would even give us more, uh, more, uh, more opportunities to launch, uh, more opportunities to, uh, to put those sensors in space? I would be inclined to say that uh, you probably could, but again, it would be to our acquisition experts to make that determination. Okay. Uh, one other challenge that I see ahead of us, being from Oklahoma, I, on, on these issues, I don't really have any... Um, parochial interests, so, other than the fact that I have constituents that die from tornadoes. Um, my mission here is to get as much data, the right data, so that we can ultimately move to a day where we have zero deaths from tornadoes. Now I know uh, what, what we're talking about generally here is the, 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 the macro scale global initial conditions for, for weather forecasting. Um, but, but my, my concern is that as we go forward with a, with a commercial capability, we're going to have a lot of data. And when you think about hyperspectral, if, if that commercial capability, when that capability comes online, there's going to be a lot of data. Uh, my, my, one of my concerns is how do we assimilate all that data into our models? Is that possible now? What do we need to invest in? How can this committee be helpful? Dr. Stoffler, I'll, or Mr. Stoffler, I'll start with you, and then, and then we'll go to Dr. Volz. Again, a very critical question. I appreciate that, Mr. Chairman. Certainly on the DOD side, we recognize that. Uh, we have uh, developed an architectural design to revamp our entire uh, computing system to A, increase computing capacity, uh, remove legacy systems. We're going to a 40 VAR assimilation scale, and we certainly believe that by the 2021 timeframe, our new architecture will be able to do all the things that you've addressed. And do we need, do we need uh, additional modeling capabilities? Do we need additional computing capacity? What, what are the things, are you, are, you, are you saying that you're good and you have everything you need to move out? Uh, I think uh, from an Air Force perspective, we've developed the plan. The Air Force has been very supportive and we're on, uh, on path by 2021 to meet our objectives. Dr. Volz. I think you pinpoint the, the exact issue that uh, the challenge that we have is that we're in a, an age of uh, explosion of data availability and the utilization of it effectively is going to be our greatest challenge. And it's not just satellite data, it's incorporating and an merging satellite data with in situ ground data, airborne data to get a better holistic picture of what's going on. And I think it's it's always going to be, we're always going to be running uphill on this and trying to get greater computing power as we bring in more data, as we simulate more data sources, the challenges are going to get more and more challenging. So even though at this point we've come a long way in the past three years with our high performance computing within NOAA and it's enabled us to ingest other data sources as part of our gap mitigation efforts to support um, the polar constellations. But now with the launch of GOES-R coming on in just a few months, which is going to have a significant 60-fold increase in the data rate that we see from now casting, how we integrate those data sets into the weather forecast on modeling and in the offices is going to challenge us as well. So there will always be need for a uh, incremental and sometimes leaps forward steps in high performance computing and the modeling to ingest these new data sets. So I would never be comfortable saying we're good where we are now. Um, we are using what we have, but we're always trying to figure out how to bring these other data sets in more efficiently and more effectively. It's going to be an ongoing challenge for as long as we're working on this. Excellent. Uh, earlier, uh, Mr. Stoffler mentioned that uh, the Department of Defense is not going to accept uh, data from, from the Russians or the Chinese. Uh, does NOAA have a position on that? Um, I think we also was, NOAA 
does not use Russian or Chinese data in our modeling and in our forecasts. We have we work with the scientific community, with the academic community, we, where the data are available through our international partnerships. They're open and where they are available for in, for operation, not for operations, but for assessment and analysis. Um, and we are watching. We are working with our academic partners to understand the capabilities, and they are getting stronger and better. So there is enticing the availability or the, the quality of the data that are available. We are not at this time using them as part of our primary products and services. But, but there's, not a, there's not a policy position that says we won't use them? I don't know if there is or not. Okay. There is not a, we're not using them at the moment. I do not know what the official policy might be on this. Okay. I'd like to yield uh, to the acting ranking member, Mr. Grayson from Florida. Dr. Volz, the May GAO report reviewed NOAA's basis for initiating work on the pol polar follow-up satellites on the basis that they wouldn't actually be put into use for a decade or more. What is the agency's position with regard to the GAO's recommendations and their observations? Um, there are a number of observations in their report, um, and I think uh, Mr. Pounder has talked about the challenge of build efficiency versus developing stale satellites which sit around for a long time. And we've looked very carefully at the lessons from from our own pose and from DMSP of how long a satellite should be in storage and how, how much you want to be able to refresh technology. And I think um, the point was made that we need to show how our plan is robust and appropriate, mixture of stability and requirements, but also efficiency in production and, and in procurement. So I believe that the approach that we have as we're going through this year, this calendar year, our final program review of what the approach would be for the launch cadence, for the launch on um, require, uh, development cadence for the PFO instrument and satellites, it will address those questions. I think what we have is we're, we're, we're doing two things at once. We're building at the most effective um, price-wise point to build these satellites, but we're also building to, prepare, to get to that robust constellation as quickly as we can. It only takes one launch failure to disrupt an entire plan of what your launch cadence should be. So we want to be able to have a satellite on, on storage or in storage and ready when we need it, but we don't want to have it sitting in storage for 20 years. I think we've got the right balance in the way that we've built and we plan on testing and storing these satellites, again, taking lessons from other satellite histories to do this appropriately uh, for the JPSS PFO program. When we launch a satellite today, are we putting in the same instruments and sensors that we put in 10 or 15 years ago? No. The JPSS and the GOES-R satellite series are leaps forward in capabilities and, and, and um, instrumentation. It is the next generation, particularly for the GOES that we're seeing in the launch this fall. JPSS is leveraging the instruments that were developed in, in a research basis for the SUMI MPP satellite, which was launched in 2011. The JPSS 1 through 4 satellites will have those same instruments. So there is a bulk, effectively, a consistent performance and observation set that we will have for the next 20 years from those four satellites. GOES-R will have a similar 20-year period from 16 to the mid-30s. That doesn't mean our observing system is stagnant at that point. All we've talked about all these other emerging capabilities, the other international partnerships that are bringing their satellites in for the commercial side. That backbone of those, of those foundational measurements that you're going to get from JPSS and GOES are complemented and support, complement and support the other measurements that come in, and then we have the challenge, as Chairman Bridenstine just mentioned, emerging those different data to an integrated system which provides a much more holistic and a higher quality understanding of the environment that we're trying to provide. Well, if we're using dramatically different uh, instruments and sensors than we did 15 years ago, doesn't it follow that we'll want to do the same thing when we do a launch 10 or 15 years from now? Won't we basically have to completely revise the guts, if you will, of the satellite before it's going to have full functionality if we're launching 10 or 15 years from now? Excellent point in that what we're launching in 15 years from now or 20 years from now is that is the next generation following what we have right now. So we are in the process right now of starting a next generation mission assessment and development, our architecture studies of what should be the next, the leap after JPSS and goes R. There's a lifetime, there's a, a generational cycle of major performance upgrades, and whether it's 10 or 20 years, it's 20 years roughly, where you have that basis, where you get used to using those instruments, where all the modeling and all the forecasters are using it, and you add incrementally from other satellite observations, increase capacity. And then as, we're, as we have this basis for JPSS, we are now looking at what should be the thing that follows, launching in, 20, in the 2030s. And we'll do that with testing and demonstrations, with commercial satellite examples, with NASA research and other research satellites that are demonstrating capabilities. And we'll be able to pick from those on-orbit experiments the best step forward, as opposed to just sitting in an a priori saying, I know what it should be. 
We get to demonstrate with these research satellites and with the commercial side to then decide what's the most effective math path forward for the backbone of the next generation, which will be launching in the mid-30s. We will start building that in the next few years, but we won't deploy it until after these four satellites, this constellation is, which is gone. Well, to be as specific as possible, <coughs> did the agency assess the likelihood that the polar follow-on satellites would have to be, um, how shall I put this, updated uh, before being put into actual use, having been built now with technology developments coming in the next decade or decade and a half? And if so, what was that assessment and how much do you think it might cost? Yes, we did, and we actually made a conscious decision a year ago as we rolled out the plan for the PFO that we would hold the requirements baseline for the PFO JPSS 3 and 4 satellites to the same standards we set for JPSS 1 and 2. We did that consciously aware of exactly the point I think that Ms. Champlain mentioned, is that when you change requirements on a system in the middle, you're basically developing a new system and you lose all control of your cost and schedule. We made that conscious decision that this suite of four satellites would be consistent and we'd be, we, we have now the contracts in place for the spacecraft, for all the instruments, so that we can accurately project and develop, deliver those instruments. But the system evol evolves and the system then brings other out capabilities in, to, to, in addition to the JPSS, so the overall capability of observing system is going to increase and improve over time, but this portion of it is going to be stable and, <clears throat> and the funding and the requirements will be well-defined and well-characterized. I'm out of time. Thank you all. I'd like to thank the gentleman from Florida for his, uh, quite frankly, great questions. Um, I, I think you're hitting on a, a, critical, uh, a, a critical thing that we need to be talking about on this committee, and, and that is uh, technology insertion plans. And one of the reasons I think commercial is so important and I want to be really clear, I support JPSS, I want to make sure JPSS is fully funded, but I do believe commercial is important because uh, commercial satellites are being launched uh, with miniaturization of technology, miniaturization of, of electronics. We're going to be able to launch a lot more satellites in, 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 in more distributed architectures um, that again complicate the targeting solution for the enemies, but also with smaller satellites you can launch more of them, you can launch them more frequently when you have new technologies that arise, you can put them in orbit very rapidly. I would, I would also say one of the areas that I've been pushing on is the hosted payload uh, concept where um, every time a commercial communication satellite launches, we could test a new sensor on that commercial communication satellite. And those satellites are launching quite frequently these days. Um, and, and not only in geostationary orbit, but now in the future, we're gonna be launching them into, into low earth orbit as well. I'd like to recognize the gentleman from Texas, Dr. Babin, for uh, final five minutes. You bet. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just had one question uh, for Mr. Pounder uh, <clears throat> concerning the uh, flyout charts and schedules uh, annually published by NOAA. Uh, do they accurately depict the state of our satellites in orbit, these, these flyout charts? Yeah, I think the flyout charts, um, there's improvements that could be made. Yeah. So, for instance, I'll, I'll just point to NPP. The NPP, the amount of fuel that's on there, that's not what's really important. What's important is how long is the spacecraft and the sensor is going to last. And we think those uh, flyout charts should reflect that. I think Dr. Volz brought up some good things with their availability assessments. They have that data. That data, when you look at the 2015 analysis, basically says that I think, I think the lifespan using their data is somewhere in the 2018 time frame, not 2020. However, that's dated, and I do want to bring up this point on ATMS again, because I think Dr. Volz is right. His answer was absolutely correct that all this data plays into for the short-term forecasts, but that's not downplay the importance of ATMS and CRIS and the importance of using those two instruments together for forecasts. If you don't have ATMS working well, there is an effect on our forecasts. So it's very important that we keep that thing going on NPP until we get J-1 up there. Okay, thank you. Well, why is NOAA fiddling with the estimated lifespan? Uh, is it to make it appear that we are not facing a data gap? We've had great debates over this data gap over the years, uh, Congressman, and you know, in our we put it on our high-risk list that the gap, potential gap in, in data here is something that's critical. 
We need to acknowledge it. We need to have appropriate contingency plans in place. I think NOAA has done a good job on that. But I think there needs to be even better transparency with these flyout charts and everything, not only this committee, but we get the same questions from the appropriators, too. It's not always clear. Yeah. And we just need better transparency. And I think we're moving in that direction, and I think there's been an acknowledgement of that. Okay. Mr. Chairman, that's all I had this morning. Thank you, witnesses, too. Thank you. Yield back. Well, thank you. Um, I'd like to thank the witnesses for their valuable testimony today and the members for their great questions. The record will remain open for the next two weeks for additional comments and written questions from members. This hearing is adjourned. All right, brother.